and a 10 cover shadow. I recently purchased the Freddy Files updated edition book off Amazon and find what details really seem to be the most important. It's also an excellent place to find confirmed details. But one thing I noticed a while after getting the book was that the shadow on the front cover. If you look closely, you can actually make out the shape of Freddy standing behind you, which I have to say is pretty damn terrifying. This implies that basically anyone who learns about the Fazbear secrets because of this book, which is presented to be some form of secret files on the cover, will get gotten by Fredbear. This makes me think that there is certainly something more to this company, definitely something shady that we aren't really considering, or that just hasn't been presented yet. But it very well might not be that deep, but uh, let's be honest, with Scott, it probably is. In at 9, Nightmare's Endo. Now this was pointed out to me last time, because in part 12 I mentioned how Nightmare seemingly has a brain, but many people were very quick to point out that actually that's Nightmare's endoskeleton. And you can actually see it specifically in FNAF VR, and it's actually true, which is just weird and just freaking insane, because like he's a dream, why would he need an endoskeleton? Anyway, apparently the animatronic was used in Ennard's VR minigame, and I can't seem to find a particular situation where he's there, but I'm, I'm sure it's in there, since if you check the animatronic gallery, available after you complete the main game, not including the tape endings, you can see the animatronic right there, clear as day, clearly listed being present in the game files. So that was something I never really knew about and I'm glad that I found out. So thank you for bringing this to my attention. If you have any more details, feel free to comment them or message me on Instagram. Message me is a more direct way to getting the information to me, however, because I do read the comments, but it may, it may take a while. <laughs> and it ain't fun time Chica Remnant. Now this point seems like it would be obvious, but not anymore, thanks to some recently revealed information. In the FNAF novels, once Apton discovers that the original animatronics are possessed, he melts their endoskeletons down, resulting in the creation of Remnant, basically molten possessed metal. But then he takes this metal and uses it to give life to the Funtime animatronics. So if there is indeed a Funtime Chica, does this mean that she got the same treatment? Because if she did, which it seems to imply that she does, then the original five missing children didn't have all their Remnant burned. Meaning that the FNAF 6 fire was pointless and Henry, along with our character, died for nothing because the mission wasn't complete. I mean, I think Henry would have taken this into account, but maybe Enter just figured that he didn't need Chica to handle it. I mean, you can purchase a Funtime Chica for the restaurant in FNAF 6, but if you choose not to, does that mean that you end up ruining the story? I don't know. Since in FNAF AR's Fast Facts, it's revealed that the Fun Times were among the first animatronics made by Afton. So maybe in the continuity of the games, the Fun Time animatronics don't contain the souls of the original five missing children, like at all, unless it was just like injecting the metal here and there instead of making whole endoskeletons out of it, so it could have been done later. I don't know. And it's seven, not for us. The job of FNAF 6 was not meant for us. This was made clear by Henry in his final speech, saying, quote, and for you, my brave volunteer, who somehow found this job listing not intended for you. This begs the question, if it wasn't meant for us, how did we find it? Since if a job is created for one specific person, I feel like it would find that person, and maybe even only that person. But not like a, in a metaphorical sense, like, oh, this job was meant for me. No, like this job was literally intended for a certain individual, yet somehow Michael Afton found it and then got it over that other person. And we know that this is the case, since this isn't a pre-recorded message, and instead live. Since if it was pre-recorded, Henry wouldn't know that it was a different person, or that Elizabeth was the one that he had cut off as soon as he started talking. Quote again, connection terminated. I'm sorry Elizabeth, if you even remember that name. End quote. And at six, like father, like daughter. It's actually in the same speech where we find out that Baby has always intended on being an evil animatronic, even to her own brother. Quote from Baby's part of the final speech. I will make you proud, Daddy, while talking about how she's gonna get us, though. But why would she say this? She knows her father is there, actually. He's in the form of Scrap Trap. So did Baby intentionally do this just so that she could become like her father? Did her death twist her mind in such a way that she now assumes her father will be proud of her if she was like him? Or is this something that William taught her? Because if we're looking for a reason his kids died, maybe it's because they wouldn't join in his killing spree? I mean, getting a kid to lure away kids is certainly easier than luring them away yourself. I mean, I don't know from experience, but I'm just, I'm guessing. And is that why Fredbear's mouth was so powerful? Powerful enough to crush Crying Child's skull? Because William needed him to die so he wouldn't out him? Or at least put him in a coma and then put him back together, enhancing him so that he would want to help his father? I mean, it certainly seems that way. Maybe this is what Scott meant by nobody had solved FNAF 4. Halfway through in at number 5, Intended Owner. 
Who was the intended owner? It's a question I ask a lot in this series, ever since we figured out that we weren't the ones who were supposed to be running the FNAF 6 location. Who did Henry originally intend on giving it to? I think I finally have an answer. Scott Cawthon. Or rather, his in-universe equivalent who doesn't have a name. And since he doesn't have a name, I'm still going to be calling him Scott. So if Scott was the intended owner, there would have to be some form of connection, right? What could it be? Well, he's an indie game dev who made the games joking about the Fazbear tragedies because Fazbear paid him to do it. So he knows about everything that went wrong there, so maybe that's why. Henry's whole plan was to make sure that nobody remembered what happened with William and his misdeeds, so maybe he was going to bring in the one person he knew for sure knew everything that had happened. Maybe there was never actually a way out plan for him, and Henry just says that as a segue to inform us that he knows we ain't gonna leave. Maybe our character wanted to leave, but just could it? I mean, the intentional owner being Scott's stand-in makes even more sense when you consider that Scott is the owner of the series. I mean, at least he was. So could it be him? Probably. I hope so. And a four animatronic interference. But why did we find the job if it wasn't intended for us? I know why. Again, in Davy's portion of the final speech, she seems to imply that the job was meant for us. You think that this job just fell out of the sky for you? Well, yeah, it would have had to if it wasn't intended for me, right? Well, it may seem like Baby just doesn't understand what's going on, let's think about it. Who is Baby? She's our sister. She's Elizabeth Afton. We see her get scooped, hence the stomach mounts on the FNAF 4 animatronics. I mean, we loved each other. We're family. And it's not like that went away. We went to sister location to find her. That's why we're here. She loves us and wants us to be a family again. The whole gang is back together. Us, her, and dear old dad. She interfered and sent us that job. That's why it didn't just fall out of the sky. It's because of her. This may be common knowledge or well known at this point, but I didn't think about it until I was watching that speech over and over again for other numbers on this list. Baby is the reason we found it, and Scott was the one meant to have it. At least it seems that way. But that's just a theory. A game theory. Getting close to the end into number three, sentience? Now, turning to the Fazbear Frights books for this number, could the animatronics actually know what they're doing? Or is this just their agony acting out? Quote from Dr. Phineas Taggart from the Book 3 epilogue, that you can take a saturation of agony at any kind of intelligence, even an artificial one, and they will combine together to transmute the energy of emotion into the energy of physical action. So it seems that Phineas believes that the emotion is what dictates the actions, not the individual who the emotions came from. This could explain the rash behavior of the animatronics and why they seem like they're in pain. It's not the children controlling them, it's the agony. The actual spirits don't have any reasoning behind their movements, they just go. That's why Elizabeth wants to make her dad proud, because while in agony she can't think straight. We just do. We're impulsive. That's what's going on with these animatronics. And we know that Phineas must be right, since he proves his thesis by creating the Stitch Wraith, which promptly kills him because it's full of the agony of multiple different things, not just one individual. Damn, a whole lot of things seem to be coming together. Penultimately, in at number 2, FNAF 4 VR. This series of minigames known as Night Terrors in FNAF VR is based on FNAF 4. We know this thanks to the appearances from Nightmare Eon and Nightmare Fredbear, as well as just the design of the room. But my question is, how do they know what this room looks like? And how do they know what these animatronics look like, for that matter? We're meant to believe that FNAF 4 takes place inside Crying Child's brain in 1983 while he's in the hospital. So how could they possibly know what these look like? It's the same reasoning why I thought Mike had to be the crying child. Because of the drawing of Nightmare in the survival logbook. But Crying Child dies after experiencing these nightmares, so how could anyone have ever been described these animatronics or these locations? We know the dream house isn't like his real house thanks to the 8-bit minigames, so how did they get this model? Did they have a visualizer in the hospital room? Because we can't even see our dreams in 2021, let alone 1983. If you have any explanations, please let me know in the comments because it can't just, it can't be the sound discs, okay? It, it can't be. He was in the hospital. There was nothing to actually alter the appearance of. It doesn't make sense. Finally, in number one, explosive ending. William dies in the man in room 1280, the third story from the fifth Fazbear Frights book quite extravagantly, from what we're told, exploding into a pile of mush right before a pastor's eyes. But how is this possible? How could William just explode like that? It's not something that you think about, but I have quite the explanation. I will admit it's a bit of a leap, but 
bear with me. William knew about possession and maybe how it worked. He knew about agony after his daughter got scooped and his son got crunched. So, what if he tried to ensure his survival by intentionally causing himself agony? Injecting or installing some form of explosive that when triggered or when in the vicinity of a Fazbear warehouse would cause him to explode from the inside out, creating what possibly is one of the most agonizing ways to die. Even for the FNAF series. I mean, this guy was absolutely mental, even potentially injecting himself with Remnant in an effort to stay alive. So for me, it isn't out of the question for William to just shove an explosive inside him just to make sure that his goal was achieved. I mean, I just, I hope that pastor didn't get a mouthful of, like, William guts. That, that doesn't sound fun. In a 10, pizza time. Pizza. Honestly, it's one of my favorite foods. I could eat pizza for lunch and dinner and be fine with it for the rest of my life. I actually honestly did that for my first year at college. God, I missed that meal plan. However, I totally missed the love that Mike seems to have for pizza in the security logbook. In fact, other than his name, it's the first thing he writes about. On page 6 of the logbook, it asks you to list 10 reasons why applying to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza seemed like a good idea at the time. Which, first of all, Scott, are you trying to get people to come for my job? Second, the number one answer and the only one Mike gives is employees get free pizza, which is understandable and could be considered a one-off. However, way later on in the book, on page 87 to be exact, interesting number by the way, when asking which animatronic would win in a fight and why, Mike writes for the glory of pizza next to a swashbuckling Captain Bonnie. And if one mention of chewing gum is enough to connect him to the older brother, damn, this guy really likes pizza. In a 9, book 10. Fazbear Frights Book 10 releases on September 7th, 2021, which is also my birthday and the day Spider-Man PS4 came out in 2018. Fun story, I actually didn't know about that game until I went to Fan Expo 2018 and met the Jovenshire who asked me about it since I was wearing a Spider-Man costume, so that was a nice way to find out. But I guess that day is just a good time to release things out into the world, to bless the world, so to speak. However, the book description, at least of one of the stories, really caught my eye. The tenth book, titled Friendly Face, is written by Scott Cawthon and Andrea Wagner, and has the description of, quote, Andrew can't spend his money fast enough on a happy companion guaranteed to keep his friend's memory alive. Which sounds awfully familiar to me, since it's my theory about what happened to Crying Child. How William programmed a robot to be an older version of Crying Child, except named Michael and gave him memories of killing his younger brother in an effort to keep him away from the fast food restaurants. But also, the name Andrew rings a bell, since it's the name of the spirit who possesses William in the man in room 1280, who had been keeping him alive from the inside. And I won't be surprised if Andrew's friend absolutely loves pizza. And it ain't helpful. The security logbook seems to make a lot of headlines in these lists, but that's because it's packed full of so many ideas and theories if you know where to look. For example, looking outside the book to the concepts and universe that involve the book. The survival logbook is meant to be the security logbook, however, Mike crossed out the word security and writes in survival. But this is a form of bringing us into the FNAF canon, by making us a night guard and this book being our training guide. But that begs the question, why this book? Why a book that is clearly been written in, especially on important things like incident logs, and why one that just straight up trashes the company, saying that this is basically a death wish and that we should have never taken this job unless it was for the pizza. It could be the last one, but even if it was, I'm sure they would print a new one with all the graffiti that's covering this book. And I mean like, it's even covered in blood for God's sakes. I mean he crossed out security and also wrote survival. It must be because the other guard or whoever hired you knows about the danger and wants you to survive. Hell, this could all just be a ruse and there was no mic to begin with, and they just wrote the book to make it more relatable to you. And it's 7 Springtrap's Revenge. Yet another questionable business decision from Fazbear Entertainment. Springtrap's Revenge is a VR game that is the subject of the Fazbear Fright story in the flesh, from Bunny Call, the fifth book in the series. The story revolves around a game theorist, sorry I mean game developer, named Matt, who creates a Springtrap AI using all of his anger from a divorce and multiple failed relationships. However, the game is too difficult, so instead Matt reprograms the game to torture Springtrap. For some reason, because he kept killing him. It's a game, dude. Just make it easier. My question is, why would they make a whole VR game around surviving Springtrap when he was a real-life serial killer in their reality? Like, sure, in our world, we wouldn't care because he isn't real, but it's not like Valve or Stress Level Zero is going around making Ted Bundy or John Wayne Gacy survival games. Because it would be in poor taste, and it would be way too real and disrespectful to the victims of those killers. Or, I mean, I guess anyone 
related to the victims of those killers. So why would Fazbear Entertainment willingly make a video game revolving around the killer that ruined their reputation in the first place? It seems like a horrible idea. Like in a world where everyone's getting cancelled. Why? And it's 6 Bite of 87. The survival logbook makes yet another appearance on this list, this time either solidifying or making the Bite of 87 even more confusing. The Bite of 87 being the mysterious incident where someone, presumably Jeremy from FNAF 2, gets his frontal lobe bitten off by an animatronic. We thought we had the animatronic who did it pinned as Mangle, but then Ultimate Custom Knight came along and proposed that maybe it was Toy Chica, with the line, where's my beak, lodged in your forehead of course. However, I think the logbook can actually give us more of an answer as to who done it. On page 35, the book asks you some would you rather questions about what you would do if you were trapped under a desk for a week surrounded by baby themed animatronics. The last question it asks you is would you rather lose a frontal lobe or an arm? Now every other question makes sense for that situation aside from this one, so why would it ask this? To remind us of the bite of 87, like we could forget. Since on page 87 we see a couple animatronic cage matches with you determining the winner and why. On page 86 this occurs as well. Both animatronics up for debate are in this section, however Mangle is the only one that appears on page 87 and is clearly set up to win, being pitted against Balloon Boy. Chica is also present, but on page 86 and against Freddy, a much more fair matchup. Is this Scott correcting us from what we thought we learned in Ultimate Custom Night, or is this just another coincidence or diversion? Tell me what you think and why in the comments. Get it because it's like that section. Halfway through in at number five, why baby? One question I've had and seen a couple times is the question of why baby was kicked out. We know that she has an argument and that's mostly why, but how did they know what parts were babies and why did they even include her in the first place? Well, they assumingly needed her abilities, but they could separate themselves because of Remnant. Something I rediscovered while researching my last video, the top 10 souls trapped in FNAF animatronics, is that in the FNAF novels it's revealed that the Funtime animatronics all contain the souls of the original five missing children. And that's probably where the idea to group together as entered came from. The desire for all parts of their souls to be together, or as close as they can be. And that's also probably a factor in why they kicked Baby out, since she contains the soul of Elizabeth Afton, the daughter of the man who took all their lives. And also because, you know, she doesn't have the soul of any of the missing children, so she was just an extra. They used her and they're like, wham bam, thank you ma'am. And for clarification. I will put you back together, a line that has caused a lot of turmoil, especially on this channel, since whenever I mention it, I'm typically referring to a theory that many people seem to disregard and even despise. However, this time I'm not talking about potential robots, I'm talking Ultimate Custom Night, since one of Nightmare Freddy's lines is, I am remade, but not by you, by the one you should not have killed. And that line speaks volumes. I'll talk more about why later in this list, but this helps us confirm one thing that we've suspected since FNAF 4, that William Afton is speaking through psychic friend Fredbear. The Fredbear plush we see follow us around during the 8-bit minigames of FNAF 4, that we later learn is being used as the camera by Afton. This proves it as being William because of the clarification, but not by you. Like, why would he say that unless William was an option? Unless he had made some sort of promise like that before, and the only other time we hear the line is in FNAF 4. This is referencing the I will put you back together line, not the I put her back together that Michael says in sister location, because that's, that's just a totally different thing. And a 3 intentional glitch. Glitch Trap is an odd character, an accidental addition to FNAF VR that somehow ends up interacting with the environment and altering aspects of the game. Well, does he? I've always questioned why Glitch Trap is able to move the curtain at the end of the game and seemingly even put us in the Freddy suit. Like sure, he's a spirit technically, but he's also game code and would have to obey the laws of such, right? Like any being must obey the laws of the form they inhabit or whatever they say in it chapter 2. So how is he able to move things like the curtain when I can't? Simple. It wasn't an accident. If he was a glitch, unintentional, how would the ending make sense? Who would put us in the Freddy suit? We wouldn't crawl in there ourselves after all, I mean like, we know what would happen. Was there another character there? Did Glitch Trap replace them? No we didn't. He was meant to be there, since you can see this ending without collecting all 16 tapes. So he wouldn't be reassembled yet. Glitch Trap was an intentional feature of this game, which makes me think, who else is working for him, since Vanny wouldn't be possessed or under his control at this point because we know that she gets possessed because of this game. Or at least, we're pretty sure. We also are pretty sure she's Tape Girl. And in 2, Nightmare's Brain. 
This is a forgotten and maybe even unnoticed detail by some from FNAF 4 that was recently pointed out to me. Nightmare from FNAF 4's final level actually has a brain. It, it, you can kind of see it, like you can see the silhouette of it behind like his like semi-transparent head. Whether this was meant to represent Crying Child being rebuilt as a robot, with his brain obviously still being alive since we're experiencing these nightmares in the game, or if it was just meant to hint at how some of these animatronics were created, the idea of brains and animatronics hasn't gone away. In fact, it's been highlighted. Take the FNAF VR Curse of Dreadbear DLC. In that DLC, we get a mini game where we must program our own Dreadbear according to preset directives. These are all calibrated into a brain that we must color, size, and configure before putting into Dreadbear's head. If we get it wrong, or take too long to do so, we get attacked and killed. Which could mean that some of these animatronics are killing or have killed simply because they were programmed wrong, instead of being programmed like that intentionally. It could be where William got the idea to use animatronics in the first place. Or the brain could just just be signifying Crying Child's brain death at the end of the game, since if he catches you, the game is over. And the brain in his head is only a further way to symbolize that. Finally, in a number one, the one you should not have killed. Here we are, the big numero uno, the one I said I'd be speaking about later on. The one you should not have killed is the main, I guess, antagonist of Ultimate Custom Night. This character, who most believe to be Cassidy, is the one causing this whole situation, trapping William in his own mind while keeping him alive in order to torture him for his crimes. And while this may still be Cassidy, I think it's Crying Child. I have a whole theory with my evidence as to why, so check that out in the top right corner if you're interested. But no matter who it is, the one you should not have killed cannot be Golden Freddy. While the evidence certainly seems to point us in that direction, now that we know William wasn't in hell or in purgatory in this game, but rather trapped in his own body thanks to the man in room 1280 from Bunny Call, we know that it just can't be possible. There is evidence in the form of Stitch Wraith that multiple souls can possess one thing, however we have not seen evidence of characters being able to possess multiple big things at once. I know that there is a character that possessed a lot of little things to my knowledge, but nobody has possessed two animatronics at the same time. In fact, in Bunny Call, William had to die for Andrew to move on to the Stitch Wraith. So based on the evidence we've seen so far, the one possessing William and keeping him alive, the one you should not have killed, whether it be Cassidy or Crying Child, cannot also be in the Golden Freddy suit. Plus, the Golden Freddy suit would not have been around at the hospital when Crying Child died, and if William had to go to the Fredbear warehouse to possess a hard drive, Crying Child would have to be around the suit to possess it. That's just how they've set up the rules. So... Yeah. In a 10 human counterpart? This point is brought to you by YouTube users Ruby Pupstar and Henry, who commented on the last Tiny Details video. The Circus Baby animatronic is a complex robot, with the spirit of Elizabeth inside and sinister goals and intentions. But she's different to her Fazbear Frikes book counterpart, but also similar in a lot of ways. One of those reasons being the pin-like mechanisms that cover her body. In the books, she uses these pins to switch between her animatronic form and a realistic human form. These these pins are also visible on the game version of the character as well. And since they're never really used for anything in game, we can safely assume that they're intended for a different purpose. Well, like, the same purpose as the book, but a different purpose. It's... you get it. But why does this matter? Well, this brings up the question, who is her human counterpart? Have we been seeing her? Do we know what she looks like in human form if she has one yet? Or is it just a design detail that shows us that she can change between looking like her and us? Since she, as a part of Ennard, takes over our bodies at the end of Sister Location. Does she have to do this before she unlocks this power, or is it always there? Will we see her in Security Breach? If I know. Anything can happen at this point. And at 9, Bad Press Bonnie. This was pointed out by multiple users in the comments from the last part, but the first one I saw was from user Sock Gems once again. These users suggested that perhaps the reason we don't see Bonnie in Security Breach is because it would be bad for business, considering how multiple kids were killed by a man wearing a golden Bonnie Springlock suit. It's also interesting how blood never triggered the mechanisms in the suit, but the, that's aside the point. Anyway, with all this attention on the Bonnie animatronic, it's understandable why they would want to keep it quiet, and only give the character a bowling alley. 
But if this was the reason why they scrapped the character, why are they still sending Springtrap animatronics in special delivery? Why are they putting out multiple skins for Springtrap? If they know that the killer used a Spring Bonnie or at least a Golden Bonnie suit, why would they risk more bad press, especially when they know these animatronics are malfunctioning? We know these games take place around the same time since the Afton virus is the thing corrupting the special delivery animatronics, but why would they continue to do that? That's so stupid. Like, I get it. These people are definitely, they are definitely missing a few brain cells, but can't be missing all of them. Come on. And before we move on to number eight, if you're enjoying this series and love that we've been able to cover over a hundred FNAF Tiny Details, be sure you're hitting that like button. It really helps us out and lets more people find the video and the channel. And check in the top right corner for the first part of the series and as well as a new playlist for it. Yeah, this, this series now deserves a playlist. Jesus. And it ain't special features. The puppet is a character I'm sure all of us love. And while a lot of fans like to turn this character into something sinister and terrifying, see the top 10 FNAF fan alternate versions of the puppet for more on that, why is it so special? According to Ultimate Custom Night Deathlines, Chica was the first of the victims, meaning that she would have to be the special one, right? At least the first of the missing children. But why is it that the puppet is the one that's able to give gifts and give life in the FNAF 2 minigame? It awakens the animatronics, so what's the deal? Is it more emotion magic, since agony is the emotion that causes possession? Is it perhaps love that can bring those things to life? We know that Henry loved his daughter, trying so hard to set her free in FNAF 3 and 6, but he also tried to keep her safe above anyone else, as we see in the Security Puppet minigame, giving Charlotte a special green bracelet that the puppet used to track her. That's the only explanation I can think of that makes sense. Maybe the puppet can feel the overwhelming love from her family, and that's how she's able Able to do it, I don't know. And it's seven dynamic duo. There are so many FNAF ships, it makes me sick to my stomach. And while that also may be the fact that I've only eaten a Kit Kat today, I didn't think that FNAF ships would go this far. There are two animatronics notably missing from the Security Breach roster, Bonnie as previously mentioned and Foxy, instead being replaced by Roxanne Wolf and Montgomery Gator. But thanks to Instagram user that Colby Flats who DM'd me and a YouTube user in the last part, they pointed out that Roxanne is actually a combination of Foxy and Bonnie, almost as if they had a child together. I know it would be impossible, considering how they're both robots and can't have a biological child child, but the design of the character matches them both closely. Wolves aren't that different from foxes, being basically cousins, foxes diverting from the wolf lineage around 12 million years ago, and Roxy plays the guitar. And the guitar was reserved exclusively for Bonnie up until this point, excluding the mediocre melodies. It's weird and I can't believe that Foxy and Bonnie have a daughter at least technically speaking, but I shouldn't be surprised at this point. And it's six, Scrabble. The Shadow Animatronics are some of the most mysterious characters in the game, but we've already talked about them in the last part. Why they were made and why is only Bonnie aggressive, those questions have already been asked. But a new question presented by G5 Studio on the last marathon for this series asked why the hell Shadow Freddy is the only Shadow Animatronic with a normal name, while Bonnie and Dee Dee have a mix of letters, R W Q F S L. F-A-S-X-C for Bonnie and X-O-R for Shadow Dee Dee. But why are their names just letters? My first and only guess is that they're some form of cipher and that we just need to decode them, but I've had no luck with visionaire ciphers and anagrams, especially with cipher anagrams, taking what I got from the cipher and trying to unscramble it. And it could also be that Scott just didn't name the animatronics and instead smashed his head on the keyboard from frustration and then just kept it. But Scott doesn't really do things like that. That's more of a me thing. And FNAF 2, where RWQFSFASXC was introduced, started to expand on the lore of the world, so it could be possible that there's something more there. Halfway through in at number five, Lost in Time. This is a bit of a wild idea, but with Afton being in a game, that game being FNAF VR, and now a virus, could he be immortal and timeless? And for those who are confused, let me try to explain. The internet has been around for ages now. Nobody born within the past 30 years has really grown up without the internet having at least some part in their lives. And viruses have also been around for ages. They've gotten a lot more complex and creative, but they've been around for a while. Could William be using this to access any point in time where the internet was still available? Like Savitar from The Flash Season 3, who tried to shatter his existence throughout time. Could William 
them have successfully done the same thing? Could he have actually used this virus on all other animatronics in the games, and that's why they attack us? I mean, this isn't really that far-fetched for a universe with possessed robots in agony and a time-traveling ball pit, so I, I'd buy it. In four mediocre melodies. This isn't entirely new news, but we've learned the origins of the mediocre melodies crew. What seemed like random additions in FNAF 6 were actually set up three games earlier. FNAF 3's Night 4 phone calls has Phone Guy talking about multiple simultaneous spring lock failures occurring at the sister location. This isn't the place we visit in that game, but rather another Fazbear joint. He says the company has deemed the suits temporarily unfit for employees, and that the classic suits are being retired to an appropriate location while being looked at by our technicians. Until replacements arrive, you'll be expected to wear the temporary costumes provided to you. Keep in mind that they were found on very short notice, so questions of appropriateness slash relevance should be deflected. And while it could have been just about some crappy knockoff Frank Frazbear costumes from AliExpress, the line about questions about relevance should be deflected seems to point that they aren't the normal Fazbear crew. And the only other group we really see are the mediocre melodies, hence why they're mediocre, they're not the original. And at 3, good ending. The good ending in FNAF 3 is the one we all try and get, as well as the one we believe to be canon. However, there are details that someone pointed out to me, like how Golden Freddy's head isn't there, but is present in the bad ending. I did know this, but had forgotten about it, deeming it inconsequential. But now we at least know why. Because despite the Happiest Day minigame, we still didn't release their soul. They didn't want to go. They wanted to stay behind to torture William for as long as they can. We brushed this off at the beginning, but we know that now. And it's interesting though, since FNAF 3 was supposed to be the end of the series. So why, if this is meant to be the end, is the Golden Freddy animatronic not released in the good ending? When these were added, Scott didn't know everyone would hate the Springtrap jump scare, but he made Golden Freddy stay anyway. Why? I guess we'll never find out. And it too crashed a desktop. I told you it would be in the next tiny details list. Golden Freddy is the most mysterious animatronic from FNAF 1, being able to move through closed doors while staying limp with no endoskeleton, and can even cause hallucinations like It's Me and Eyeless Bonnie, along with changing posters on the wall. I figured they can do this because of other emotions, but why do they crash us to the desktop when they jump scare us? It's a weird moment, especially the first time, but it's certainly going to crash you whenever you get killed by this freaky fiend. But this has bigger implications than we first thought, since now the series is about video games interacting with the real world, and even FNAF World had those elements, having to set up the clues to unlock the good ending in FNAF 3. But this is the first instance of FNAF interacting with reality, and it's our reality, not the in-game reality that we would assume. This also happens with Nightmare in FNAF 4. Is this symbolic of death? Like if you die in the FNAF universe, do you get reborn in ours? And if that's the case, are we going to have to deal with a real William Afton sometime soon? Hmm. Keep an eye on the news, and don't go to Chuck E. Cheese. Finally, in a number one, preference. Sister Location was the first FNAF game to introduce entirely new animatronics with their own look. And the story is fantastic. But at the end of the game, we get a whole load of robotic parts shoved inside us without our consent, and then we start bruising from the inside until we vomit out the innards and go about our business. Like, nothing happened, for some reason. They needed a skin suit to blend into the real world and escape the facility, but why us? Sure, we may look like the only person in the place, but just before we get scooped, we see two technicians hanging on either side of our office. Why not just take one of them instead? Perhaps because they didn't trust Baby, or they knew how to fight back since, you know, they're technicians. Or maybe because they know Mike is also a robot, hence why Baby says he won't die after ejecting themselves from his body. He didn't have organic parts. His insides were an endoskeleton. That's right, I'm back on the train. It's happening. It's gonna be a thing.